Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. It's hard to think of a more consistently strained relationship in the European Union than the one Brussels has with the Hungarian government. Since Prime Minister Viktor Orban won a landslide election 12 years ago, he and the EU have crossed swords on a whole range of issues, the electoral system, uh, the media, sexual minorities, migration, Russia and Ukraine, and EU funds. Currently at stake are around 13 billion euros of financing for Hungary, which are currently blocked until Brussels sees movement on rule of law issues in Hungary. That sum of money corresponds to around 10% of Hungary's, Hungary's estimated GDP in 2022. Well, the negotiations with the EU come just as Hungary tries to tame high inflation, which is, of course, not a purely Hungarian problem. Joining me is none other than the Hungarian Foreign Minister, Peter Siarto. Welcome back to the programme, Foreign Minister. Thank you so much for the invitation. Happy to be back. So, uh, I've mentioned these negotiations between your government and Brussels. I I'm just wondering whether the fact that so soon after these talks, you went to this uh, Russian uh, energy exposition uh, in, uh, in Russia, d does that not send the wrong signal to your uh, European partners, do you think? We have always considered the energy issue as a physical as of physical nature, nothing to do with ideological or political approach. So the fact that uh, we are cooperating with Russia on energy issues is not because of our political taste or not because of being fun. This is because of the infrastructural determination in the region. If you look at the map of Central Europe, when it comes to pipelines, when it comes to uh, grids, then you understand very clearly that for my country, because of infrastructural determination, because of physical reasons, it is impossible to supply the country with enough uh, oil or gas without Russia. There are more interconnectors now with uh, other neighbouring countries. You could do a lot more, surely, with liquefied natural gas from Poland, from Croatia. Uh, you could bet more on hydrogen, on biogas. Well, yeah, well, I explained to you and it will be very uh, simple. So we have made our own homework. We have interconnected ourselves with six of the seven neighboring countries. But if other countries uh, do not make their homework, it's not our fault. We are the number one <coughs> customer for the LNG port in Croatia. We are the number one. We cannot be bigger than that. So we import from there as much as it is just possible. The whole landscape in the region, though, could have been changed if a big American and an Austrian company had not let us down. What happened? There's a big gas field under the Black Sea in Romania, uh, where an American and an Austrian company had the right to exploit the gas. They have told us, keep on telling us for seven years that they would do that. We signed the contract with them for three billion cu cubic meters annually. They should have started to deliver uh, as of January 1st the next year. But what happened? The Americans and the Austrians announced that financially it doesn't work out for, for them, so they left. So we are still dependent on Russian. Okay, so you, you're saying you know there are these external factors which are to blame, essentially. But uh, it was interesting. I was talking to the deputy mayor of Budapest a couple of weeks ago who was saying, We've lost a decade in Hungary. She said that there have been lots of EU funds available for renewables and refurbishment of buildings, but these funds simply haven't been used. She says, she, she told me, we could already have saved 30% of the energy we currently use. This was down to your government, not blaming anyone else outside. Yeah, you quoted now a uh, well-known uh, person of the opposition, so you have to put into consideration her political affiliation. Well, well I think she, yeah, she uh, has her facts and figures on uh, 30%. I do have less. mine. I do have mine as well. So the thing is that we have done our best in the recent decade in order to upgrade the energy system of the country. We are accelerating now the nuclear uh, capacity uh, to, be, um, um, to be upgraded. You in France use nuclear energy as well. You know uh, to what extent it is reliable, it is uh, uh, absolutely safe, it is cheap way of generating energy, it is environmentally friendly. And, and you're expanding uh, the, the, the Already uh, nuclear plant, energy yes. at, at the PAC uh, nuclear Puxh, energy Puxh, plant. Yes. Yeah. And uh, French play an important role there because Framatom, Framatom is delivering the control and command system to the new energy. But, but the main financing is with, with Rosatom still, yes. isn't it? Yes, we have signed the contract back in 2014 with Rosatom because the currently existing plant runs on Rosatom technology, so we didn't want to um, you know, put an experiment there, how two different technologies right. would work together. So Rosatom is the main constructor, but once again, I'm gonna I would like to tell you that the main, the, the core, the control and command system comes from France. Uh, 
you you talked about expanding th- this this plant recently. Yes. You you were in talks with with the, the relevant uh, Russian interlocutors. Again, this is the kind of thing which Western members of the EU, at least, uh, and Baltic states, of course, some of even some of your Visegrad uh, colleagues will look at and say this is the wrong strategic choice. But the, as a NATO ally, you could be working with more with American uh, nuclear energy companies, for example. Uh, but you know they are hypocritical. And I tell you why. Because when we put together the current sanction regime, uh, we made it very clear, I mean we as the European Union, that the peaceful use, the commercial use of nuclear energy does not fall under the sanction regime. It is, it is written there. Um, l- let's talk a bit about uh, Ukraine, because uh, there are some EU countries that are now readying a ninth uh, series of a ninth package of sanctions that they want to uh, do at the same time as a as a cap on uh, Russian oil. Uh, will you be voting in favour of that that package? Um, look, we are neighbours of Ukraine. We are a direct neighbour. Mm. So the impacts of the war on us immediate and severe. We have uh, allowed one million refugees already from Ukraine to enter the territory of uh, Hungary. Our inflation is skyrocketing, as you have uh, just mentioned. Last year, we had to pay 7 billion euros for our imported energy. This year, we have to pay 19 billion. Instead of 7, 19 billion. So when it comes to the uh, ninth package, you know what we want is not another package. We want peace. People are dying. A land for peace deal? I don't think I should go into uh, commenting that because it's not my job and not my business. What I know is that we support and stand up for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. We uh, want the uh, peace to come and the war uh, to end. So instead of a new sanction package, what we need is creating peace. So, so w- will you veto the, the ninth package, do you think? Since there's no uh, proposal on the table yet. I just want to come on, uh, Peter Sierto, a little bit to uh, some of these domestic reform issues Please. which are in the negotiations with, with Brussels. Uh, the, 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 the 17 uh, remedial measures that your government proposed to the European Union, um, the, the, there was a, a report by cross par- a cross-party panel of MEPs, including the European People's Party, so not only left-wing MEPs, that uh, they published a written assessment on the 17th of November saying that your government has only satisfied three of the 17 proposed remedial measures and they're saying there needs to be long-term monitoring of the implementation. Uh, then th- so far it's only three out of 17. Uh, I'm sure you'll dispute that. But would you expect, would you accept a long-term monitoring uh, mechanism, even if there's a deal in Brussels on the 6th? First of all, I understand that was not the most important part of the question, but I would doubt whether EPP would not be on the left side of the political spectrum. But anyhow, uh, you know, um, when it comes to um, these uh, procedures with the European Union, this is not the first time we are having such kind of situation uh, with Brussels. But back in those times when Mr. Barroso was the European Commission president, it was a very fair Uh, let's say, procedure, because it was legally based. European Commission has come forward with a legal proposal, which we could address. And then at the end of the day, we agreed. Whether they were right, whether we were right, or if we couldn't agree, then the European Court uh, made the ruling. But currently, this is not the case. Uh, Currently, there are political perceptions against Hungary, because there's a conservative Christian Democrat government in place for the last 12 years. And on top of that, we are successful. Now, finally, we agreed. Yes, finally, we agreed on a closed list almost closely list of 17 um, drafts. Well, which, sir, it's not yes. only perception because yeah. OLAF, the EU anti-corruption, anti-fraud office, found uh, irregularities on 4% of funds, yeah. which is actually but, a lot higher I mean, than other countries. Uh, no, no, I, I mean, come on. If I, I always hear this, you know, char or this accusation that there's corruption in Hungary. Look, if there's a systematic corruption in the country, the economy of the country would not uh, grow. And our GDP has been growing uh, uh, with an amount which is well above the European average. If there was systematic corruption, it wouldn't take place. But back to the 17 drafts. Yes, yeah. there was an agreement about almost closed list. We put all the drafts on the uh, agenda of the parliament. The parliament is working on them. I'm pretty sure that uh, we will be able to adopt uh, these 17 pieces of regulation. And then the ball will be on the court of the European Commission. And European parliament is not a stakeholder uh, in this political. A European parliament is a political body making political but, judgment. There's a leftist majority. They hate us, but, politically speaking. So they will always come was, out with statements. But it was statements. in the parliament. It was, ultimately, it was the EU Council of Ministers that agreed to this conditionality mechanism. That That's why I say we are in negotiations with them and not yes, with the European absolutely. Parliament. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, so in terms of the uh, 
the, the pressure that you've been getting because, of course, some countries, and it's not just the European Parliament, a group of countries, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, for example, they're all saying uh, there has to be a, a long-term uh, system to make sure that there's no backsliding after an agreement. W would, you, would you agree to some sort of long-term mechanism you know, uh, it's, it's, from it's, the it's, EU it's, Council? It's a matter of such a big and shameful disrespect on behalf of these countries towards the Hungarian people. Why they are doing that? Because in Hungary we have a right-wing, a conservative, patriotic, Christian democratic government. They hate us, politically speaking, because we are going against the mainstream and still we are successful. But this is based on the decision of the Hungarian people. These countries, you or the governments of these countries you just listed, they always speak about democracy, then respect democracy. The Hungarian people decided for on four continuous elections with the landslide that they want this, what we are doing, you know, questioning the ability and the maturity of the Hungarian people, whether uh, they can ensure that there's democracy, there's stability, there's freedom in the country, that's shameful, I have to tell you. But, but, but don't those countries look at the actual, uh, w what civil society has said inside Hungary itself, and, for example, the fact that several uh, members of Transparency International were excluded from the Integrity Authority. I mean, there's criticism inside Hungary itself. It's not just from the Netherlands. Of course, this is about democracy. But should we say that President Macron is not a democratic leader because there are criticism uh, out there in France against President Macron? Of course, because we are in politics. So there's always criticism against the government. But considering it or questioning the democratic nature of a country just because there are critical voices, I think that's too much. Because there was there would be no democracy if if there were no critical voices, because if there are no critical voices, it means that there's no opposition, there's no freedom of expression. So, I mean, having critical voices in a country is a proof that there's a democracy. Final yes. quick answer. You're confident then that there will be a deal on the recovery fund and the cohesion fund in early December? Well, we do our best. It will not depend on us for sure. Thank you so much for being my guest, Thank Peter Sierto, the Hungarian Foreign Minister here in the studio with me in Paris. And do join me for a part two of Talking Europe. I'll bring you a debate with a panel of MEPs from the European Parliament. Do stay tuned.